morning, church. Morning. Happy Sunday. Thank you all for being here. Uh, let's just take a moment just to quiet our hearts down as we begin to worship the Lord. to read from Micah 6 for us this morning. Micah 6, 6, 7, and 8. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come with burnt offerings, with yearly calves? Does the Lord take pleasure in thousands of rams, in ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my wrongdoings, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, mortal one, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Lord, we just come before you today. And we have a we come before the mighty one, our creator, our friend, and our savior. God, we know that you desire more than just burnt offerings and just our daily routines of, of coming to church. So help us to love you with our whole heart, to walk with you humbly, and to do what is right. Lord, so as we come this morning, Lord, help us to turn our hearts, our whole attention upon you, to praise our awesome God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we please rise? Messiah, you're Messiah, and my 
Your goodness is running out. 
come to you. God, we know that you have been faithful every single moment of our lives. I'm just reminded of the, the poem Footprints in the Sand. God, even through our darkest times, God, we know that you're there walking beside us. You're the one who carries us. And we thank you.
God, we just thank you. Thank you for this time to be able to be in your presence. God, we just pray for your work in our hearts. God, help us to walk with you, to see as you see, and to love as you love. And we just lift up today into your hands as we just lift up Andy as well as he, as he preaches. Lord, as we look into the book of Daniel, Lord, just speak into our lives. Help us to walk with you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good morning. I'm going to... Karina, I'm going to raise your mic a little bit, just so you know. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Glad you can be here. Um, we have a, a number of announcements to get to, so uh, you might want to pay attention real quick. Uh, first off, uh, I, I think I can say on behalf of uh, Jonathan's family, um, thank you for all for who attended this last Thursday, who gave a helping hand. Um, uh, I, I, we always prayed that it was honoring, not only to... Jonathan, his family, but to the Lord, and so I just want to thank those of you who, um, who supported the family, and uh, as, as you know, uh, they'll need continual support and prayer, and uh, so I, I think we can say we can reach, continue to reach out and, and give support to them. Um, they will have the, um, the burial portion of uh, the memorial tomorrow at 3 o'clock at Rose Hills, um, so that information is there for you as well. Um, we have a number of different uh, announcements to get, so you might want to write down, it's going to be up on the screen. Um, just when we thought July couldn't be any busier, we thought, you know what, let's make August busy too. So August is going to be packed as well. Uh, we're going to have a couple um, workshops on Friday nights. It's on, let me, I got to pay attention to my own announcement here, on the 19th. And the 26th and then September 9th, so three workshops, parental workshops, will come on Friday nights. And you can see the themes up there from understanding parenting, communication with our children, and then parents' role in the spiritual formation of our children. So three really critical and important um, topics for parents today, the challenges today. So we're going to have a guest um, uh, professor to, to come and do the workshop. So those you can invite people. Invite some parents that uh, you know, kids. You can make sure your parents go and say, "Yeah, you know, mom and dad, you need to go to this. You need to learn some things." Okay, so you can encourage them to go and be a part of it. And then the following Sunday, we're going to have in the CE time some discussion time to follow up, discuss some of those things on that following Sunday. Okay, so you can calendar that. Keep that in mind for the Fridays. Um, church retreat is next weekend. That's kind of crazy. You know, I, I still can't believe it's next weekend. So it's really exciting. So again, I'm going to encourage those of you who cannot come to the retreat. We do have three slots that opened up, by the way. So if, if you want to go, let us know today. And there are three slots that opened up. Um, so uh, if, if you want to come, please let us know after service. But if you're not going to be able to join us, we will have some kind of streaming Sunday live. We won't be meeting in person next Sunday. So you can 
you know, roll out of bed in your pajamas and go to church, all right? That's okay next Sunday. Uh, we're going to strew our best to have us live stream during the retreat. So we're going to test the connection to see if we can do it on our first two sessions. If not, if the signal's not strong enough, Sunday morning we will have something for you that you can tune in. Um, go to our either our YouTube channel or straight through our website, and you can um, go with service there. So we want to still keep you connected, even though you're not with us in person at the retreat. Some things to keep in mind for those of us who are going: um, you're gonna, you may want to bring some fans for a fan for your your cabin. Um, you know, I hear there's no AC, uh, so you might want to just stay stay cool. I know, I see, I see your expression. The pain, I feel it too, okay? I feel it too. <laughs> but, so you might want to bring a fan, you know, just bear in mind. Um, I'm going to ask a favor. If you have a clean bucket, I say clean. If you could bring a clean bucket, I need eight buckets. So like a little pail, okay, um, for, for an activity. So if you have one, if you could bring a clean bucket, I really appreciate it. So eight buckets, okay? I have one, so I need seven. Okay, so if you can do it, I'd appreciate it, okay? Uh, and you'll find out why. Um, anything about retreats? Um, oh, check your email, check the church Slack. We have important announcements, go about the retreat, some things you want to read up, packing lists, bring your Bibles. Yes, bring your Bibles. I know it's crazy. I encourage you to bring it to church. Uh, I think there's maybe, how many have brought your Bible to church today? One, two, three, four, five, six. Don't be seven. Seven. I know you're like, are you guilty me, Pastor Mike? And I say, yes, I am. Bring your Bibles to church, please. I know I have it up on the screen, but I'd like you to bring your Bibles to church. But also bring it to retreat, please. Bring a journal. If you have a notebook, bring that too. Yes, we'll have a booklet. Yes, there's space to write notes on it. But I encourage you to do so because we all lose our retreat booklets here and there okay so do that um i think that's it a retreat so yeah go to your sl the church slack check your email we have important announcements important checklists um packing list things like that so make sure you do that get your test done get your test done your pcr test done um, before you leave for a retreat uh that's that's a requirement that oak glen has and we want to reinforce that as well so that hopefully um, we're all healthy. We come out of it healthy. Pray for their health. Um, things like that, okay? Um, baptism class. We're going to target the last Sunday of August to be our baptism, next baptism Sunday. So if you're not yet baptized and you're praying, you're thinking about it, should I get baptized? Come see me. We want to be able to uh, help you and understand what baptism means. Should I get baptized? Why should I get baptized? We want to encourage you to do that as well. Okay, um, let's see. Last announcement, it's not on the screen. For those of you, and you'll know who you are, who helps close down the facilities, you, you make sure things are locked and stuff. If I can meet with you up here after service, I have some things to go over with you all. Okay, so if you're involved with that, please come see me after service up here and just have some things to talk to you about. Okay, all right. Uh, prayer requests, of course, um, continue to pray for the family. Continue to pray for Cindy's family as well. Um, uh, I just heard that there was another church member who lost a family member uh, this past week. Um, just continue to pray for support, pray for God's comfort and hands over the families that are grieving, um, that are mourning. Um, continue to pray for Ken's mom as well. And again, if there's any prayer requests that you would like us to know and to pray for, please let us know. We'd love to cover you in prayer, whether it's on the major announcements, it doesn't have to be. We want to make sure you know that there's people praying for you in your needs, okay? Um, of course, uh, first and third Wednesday, we have prayer meetings, Christian education, Sunday mornings for anchor and adults at 10 the 10 o'clock hour over in room 6 and 7 across the way. Friday night fellowship, of course, we don't have Friday night fellowship this Friday because we're going to be at the retreat. Um, and offering, uh, online offering is coming, I promise, it's coming soon, so hopefully it'll be coming real soon. And uh, finally, that's it. That was a lot, huh? I feel like I gave a sermon already. All right, so why don't we just like stretch, say good morning to somebody, say God bless you to somebody, and if you're watching online, 
you know what to do. We'll be right back. All right.
Good morning. Uh, the last sermon series I spoke on was on the prophet Jonah, and it was, uh, it was pretty eye-opening for me. And I saw myself as Jonah in his failures uh, in each of the four short chapters that we covered, and I saw a lot of parallels in my own life. Today, I'd like to begin a series in the book of Daniel. Uh, but before we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we invite you, the Holy Spirit, to join us this morning. Be with us, convict our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, I was talking to my dad the other day. Um, I was asking him about the Japanese rule over Taiwan. Um, and it, be, it happened in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, 1895 to 1945, 50 years. Anyone here know about this time in history? Handful of people. Thank you, Henry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, eh, yeah, okay. Um, I confess, I didn't really know much about this time. Uh, I'm not going to be making a political statement or editorializing my thoughts on this period of history. I've I try to use neutral colors, okay, purple and orange. I hope there isn't a purple political party or an orange political party, okay. There's, uh, I'm strictly approaching this from a factual point of view, okay. And, and, and most of what I'm going to say is, is, is from my dad's recollection, uh, rec recollection of the period. Uh, he partially lived through it. I won't get into the history of why Japan ruled over Taiwan. You either already know or you can look it up later. My dad was born in 1940. So he was five when Japan left Taiwan, but he still has memories of it, amazingly. So apparently, uh, Japan treated Taiwan as if they were going to be Japanese people. It was, it was treated as Japanese territory. And Japan had this rule that newborn babies had to have Japanese names. And my dad even has a Japanese nickname that my mom and his friends call him to this day. Uh, his, own, his own mother, my grandmother, also called him by his Japanese nickname, Take. Uh, in school, the students had to learn the Japanese language. He remembered his older brother had to learn it, but once Japan left, uh, he, he, forgot all, he forgot most of it. Um, according to my dad, Japan strengthened Taiwan's infrastructure. They built railroads, um, sugar factories, they built dams. Japan sent the smartest Taiwanese people back to, Japan to back to Japan to study. And they could only study subjects in the medical field. Uh, they weren't allowed to study anything related to politics, probably fear of uprising or, or something. And my own grandfather on my mother's side, uh, he was a doctor and he studied in Japan under this, under this rule, under this policy. Well, today we begin in the book of Daniel, and before we get into the passage, I, I kind of wanted to give some general background on Israel's history and the events leading up to Daniel's life. I think most of us have heard of King David. I, I promise this will be quick, because I, I can tell, like, oh my gosh, he's going to give a history lesson. Um, we've heard of King David, and that's where I'll start. And if you don't know who King David is, he was one of the last kings of Israel. Uh, he was pretty well known, okay, biblically. And because of reasons, okay, uh, God split the kingdom into two. And basically, the, the, uh, the people, uh, they forgot God, they turned, his, they turned their back on him, and so, you know, they didn't obey God, they didn't do right in God's eyes, they didn't keep his laws. And so he split it into two, Israel to the north and Judah to the south, all right? Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Okay, everybody still following? And if you remember, there are 12 tribes of Israel. So 12 tribes, during the split, 10 of the tribes go up north, they stay in the north, and they call them the northern kingdom, okay? And they, I don't know if they get to, but they keep the name Israel. Maybe they, they think, oh, we're, we're, we're 10, so we get to keep the name Israel. So they, they keep the name Israel. And the remaining two tribes, oh, and their new, their new capital is uh, Samaria. I know it's in small font there. Uh, the remaining two tribes are just the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And they take the name Judah, okay? And their capital remains uh, Jerusalem, okay? And so that's it. That was it. King David had 12 tribes. But then God's like, mm, no, you guys are split up, right? Ten go to the north, two to go to the south. And so now it's Israel and Judah, okay? And 
the stuff to the right where you see the Syrians and the Babylonians, that's actually when they were conquered. Okay, and so that, that's how Israel was kind of dispersed. Okay, and today, so you can see the Babylonians conquered Judah three times. Um, we're going to talk about the middle one in five, um, 597. 597, it says 597 BC uh, there. Um, so this is our passage for today, okay? Babylon comes in and conquers Judah in 597, okay? This is, so we're going to go to, we're going to go to Daniel chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, join me, otherwise I will have the passage up here. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. So, as I said before, at this point, the northern kingdom doesn't exist anymore. They've already been, taken care they've already been uh, conquered by the Assyrian Empire. Uh, we saw that on the previous slide, right? And now Judah, the southern kingdom, gets taken captive by the Babylonian Empire. And this, this is now the setting of Daniel, okay? And you notice, if, if you look at the passage, right, King Nebuchadnezzar took article stuff from the temple of God, and he put it in his own temple to his own God. They're probably expensive things made of gold, goblets and plates and, and whatnot, and why would, why would he do this? Why would he do this? You see, back then, you kind of show your power when you can take away something from the God of your enemy and put it in the temple of your own God, right? Kind of like, you know, you're, you're kind of showing off, like taking something away from them. Shows my God is powerful, more powerful than your God. See, I have your God's stuff in my temple, right? I'll take your expensive and sacred things, and I'll mess up your temple, and I'll, I'll add all the, all the booty, right, uh, to the collection of my God's temple. Ha ha, I win, you lose, okay? And I'm going to put it on display. And sports has the same thing. Um, the college I graduated from has a football rivalry with another college. And each time one team wins, they get this huge axe that they get to bring home. And as the teams beat each other over the years, they have to give that same axe back and forth to each other, right? And that's, this is the actually, this is, I'll try to highlight, this is actually the same axe. Just, you're just seeing both sides of the same axe. And along that handle, you can see all these, all these little tick marks, they kind of engrave the year that they beat that other team, okay? King Nebuchadnezzar is doing the same thing, right? He's taking something, he's showing it on display. Look, we, I beat those silly you know, Israelites. Um, so let's, let's continue on. In verse 3, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. Well, that's interesting. Do you remember when I talked about Japan earlier? Taking smart people, retraining them, making them learn the Japanese language, making them doctors. Here we see that Babylon is beginning to retrain Judah and only the, only the smartest and the brightest and then make them learn the language and the literature of the Babylonians, right? The, the young men without any physical defect, handsome, that already disqualifies me, right? Uh, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, right? He, he's cherry-picking the good people, and he's going to train them, right? He's going to make them, just like Japan did with Taiwan. The smartest people go back and, and, and learn to be doctors. The king assigned them, a, uh, verse 5, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were, be, they were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Well, that's interesting. Do you remember when I talked about Japan earlier, requiring people to have Japanese names? Here, Babylon chooses specific people to give a specialized education. You know, specific people who are likely to be natural leaders already. Remember, it was from the royal family and the nobility, right? And they're going to be treated royally. They're going to be treated well. 
the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, right? This wasn't bread and water. If it was good enough for the king, then it was good enough for these young Israelites, these good-looking, smart Israelites. King Nebuchadnezzar is trying to, to reprogram the smartest people. New language, new literature, new culture, new food, new diet. And after three years, these young men would enter the royal service. Smart. Right? You assimilate the best and brightest of the next generation. And their skills benefit your country, not your enemies. King Nebuchadnezzar knows what he's doing. Right? Young Israelites shipped off to a foreign land, right? placed in the hands of a foreign official with a foreign name, who are called foreign titles, given a foreign education, a foreign diet, with foreign names. And all this to prepare them to serve in the foreign court. And when I put myself in their shoes, man, I can't help but wonder what the future brings, right? right? I think it would be scary. The unknown. And you can see at this point, the, the, Babylon, the Babylon government is controlling every aspect of their lives. What they learn, what they eat, even what they're called. Verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, look, okay, okay, he didn't say look, I am afraid of my lord the king, Nebuchadnezzar, right, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other men your age? The king would, have my, would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your, serv for please test your servants for ten, day ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. Daniel's tr probably trying to avoid total assimilation into the Babylonian culture. And he has to be wise about it, right? He has to pick and choose his battles. His education, his new name, there's probably very little he can do to change that. But what he and his friends eat, well, there he sees an opportunity to respectfully challenge the menu, right? In verse 8, right, he asks the chief official for permission. He doesn't demand. In verse 12, he says, please test your servants. He's being humble. He's not trying to demand anything. And we are what we eat. And I'm sure you've noticed, foreigners living in another country will often try to maintain their identity by eating the same foods as they grew up in their home country as best they can. Israel's no exception. They have a lot of their own food laws. And I don't know what exactly was, was so bad and defiling about Babylonian food, but he, this, is, this is where Daniel finally takes a stand, a respectful stand, and we'll come back to that. He's trying to at least maintain some part of his identity as an Israelite. So Daniel proposes to the guard, look, could you just give us veggies and water? Just 10 days is all I ask. Then judge for yourself. Make a decision and we'll respect it. If we look worse, fine. We'll go back to the royal food, no problem. But if we look better though, then maybe you'll reconsider and you'll let us stay on the veggies. Can't hurt to try, right? Daniel is pretty persuasive. And so, okay, let, let, let's see what happens. At verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, they look healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Well, 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 what have we here? It works, right? And apparently veggies are better for you. As soon as my son can start reading, I'm going to make him read this passage over and over again because he does not like vegetables. So this 10-day test becomes a permanent menu, right? And man, you know what? How would you feel if you were the other men in the control group? You guys know scientific, you know, right, in the control group. That's rough, right? Probably some grumbling right now, right? You had all this nice food from the king's table, and now because of this bozo over here, for the next three years, I got to eat veggies and water. I think God is trying to tell us this passage 
that we should start serving vegetables and water after church every week. How would that sound to you all? Eileen? Okay? You still want the Korean hot dogs and the Yoshinoya, right? Yeah, I knew it. Okay, I'm kidding. I don't think God is trying to tell us that. I can tell Ted was already going to, he's starting to text me about the theology of my message. I saw him, so Ted, I was kidding. All right, verse 17, let's continue on. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. God gives them knowledge and understanding. And I want to pause here to say God's an actor in this story. We may be tempted to think that God abandoned Israel, but he didn't. Behind the scenes, he is still shaping the story in ways that Daniel and his friends probably could not imagine. And essentially, they're being told, you're Babylonian now. You are Babylonian now. You're no longer Israelites anymore. Welcome to your new life. And so, yeah, I would be tempted to think that God had abandoned them. But if you look at, the, if you look at specific verses, um, and I've, 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 I've highlighted here, in verse 2, the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah. In verse 9, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion. In verse 17, God gave them knowledge and understanding. And you might argue, oh, but in verse 2, he, he, he delivered them. But God is still guiding them. Even though it's not a good thing to be conquered by another country, God is still guiding them. God is still watching over them. Verse 18, at the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every, verse 20, in every manner of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Have you ever seen that show, America's Got Talent? Or American Idol? Or know what I'm talking about? They, they used to be really popular. They still are popular on TV. Right? You, they have these contestants that are judged by a, a panel of judges, and if you're good enough, you move on to the next round. This is basically Judah's Got Talent. Right? Everyone trains for three years. Right? And the king gets to decide who gets to serve. And the king finds none equal to these four men. And so it's no surprise because they're God on their side that they're the best at what they do, ten times better than anyone else. I think Daniel wanted to, wanted to preserve his identity in some small way to not give up completely, completely in becoming a Babylonian citizen. And I think a takeaway is that we need to retain our identities as Christians in a time where it is so easy to blend in with the rest of the world. If you're a Christian, I think we can be tempted to assimilate into the world. It can be convenient. Sometimes it's the path of least resistance. I think we can become lazy in our identity as Christians. I did. I was lazy back in college and post-college. I was a lazy Christian. I knew that I believed, but from the outside, you couldn't tell me apart from anybody else. From my behavior, from what I said or what I did, I looked like just like anyone else. But Christians should look like Christians to the rest of the world. You are in verse, in Matthew, Matthew 5, you are light of the world. Light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Being in the world is necessary. It is necessary. We are to be a light to those who are in spiritual darkness. We're called to live in such a way so that non-Christians see our words and our actions and our views and know that there's something different, something different in a good way about us. If we are a Christian, we're to make every effort to live, to think, and to act. If, if we make a, uh, an effort to live and to think and to act like everyone else, well, then we're doing Jesus a great disservice. When I was younger, much younger, I would use inappropriate language a lot. It was the language everyone else was using. It made you look cool. Why not? And my youth leaders were at church, but I was at school. Everyone was doing it. Fit in. Fit in. Assimilate. Don't make waves. When I worked at a previous job, some people would pad expense reports. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
all the working people, padding expense reports, were only required to show receipts if the amount was over $25. Anything under $25, we could just claim it without the receipt. And everybody did it. And so I eventually did as well. Why not? Everyone was doing it. Fit in. Assimilate. Don't make waves. I think we can be tempted to assimilate into this world, not in only in words or actions, but in our viewpoints as well, how we think. Our views on homosexuality, our views on abortion, our views in politics. We may be tempted to adjust our views based on what popular thought or the loudest group on social media is. So we need to be careful. Otherwise, we will become just like the world. And then there will be no discernible difference between the secular world and Christians. And if you've noticed, our nation has become more vocal, more divided over the past several years. We cannot really agree on the LGBTQIA movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, COVID-19, politics, gun control, capital punishment, and most recently, abortion. But we need to take a stand, but respectfully, just like Daniel did in today's passage. He had the wisdom to know which things he could challenge, like the, like, you know, that, that he could challenge, like the food he ate, versus the things that he probably could not challenge, like his new education or his new name. I, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I am ethnic, ethnically Taiwanese, and there weren't really many Taiwanese people in Cincinnati, but the few that were there organized themselves into a Taiwanese association. It was actually called that, the Taiwanese Association. It was a big social club, I thought. We would do things together. We'd play tennis and softball together, have potlucks at each other's houses. We were organized. There was a sign-up sheet, and, and, and each home would host a potluck that month. And we'd all get together. And I know the former, and uh, you know, there's, there's, I know we have a, at Harvest LA and, 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 and this church, Generation Church LA, there's, there's, a, there's a Brazilian contingent, and I know they would meet together. I got secretly invited a couple times. <laughs> Once a year, there was a cultural celebration in downtown Cincinnati um, at, the, at the convention center. There's a convention center in downtown Cincinnati. Uh, it was called the International Folk Festival. I Googled it, 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 no, it no longer happens, it's sad. But the, asso the association would sign up for that and there would be food and culture exhibits. We would cook Asian food and sell it at a booth. We'd build some, <laughs> we had built some replica of a Taiwanese landmark, you know. Uh, we had a merchandise booth where we would sell like Asian touristy stuff, right? We had a calligraphy booth, right? You get your name written in, 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 in Chinese characters, right? You've seen that, right? Get your name written in Chinese characters. We won ribbons, I remember. Our parents made all of us second generation kids. Uh, they, made us <laughs> they made us dance in these cultural dances to perform in front of crowds, right? I still remember this. I see Eileen laughing, so I'm gonna be talking to her why she's laughing right now, because she probably knows what I'm talking about, right? This is my dad here, and he's doing the Chinese Taiwanese calligraphy for 25 cents, do you see that? 25 cents. I get yelled at, like, how come you don't smile as much, Andy? I don't know where I get it from. These are my parents. I think this is Taiwan here. This is a 3D uh, clay uh, replica. But those are my parents. This is uh, us at the Taiwanese, this is Taiwanese, you can't, um, I've circled it here, but you can't, it's blurry. But we're selling food there to, to the people at the International Folk Festival. This is me. I am on this stage. But I'm gonna move off that quickly because the kids are gonna take a picture and they're gonna try to meme me because I know you guys, how, I know how you guys think. So that was it. But I was in that picture. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you which one I was. But they made me, I asked my dad to pull pictures and he found it and I'm like, I still remember that hat and the fake hoe that I had to, okay, it doesn't matter. But they made us do these things, my brother and I. And also once a year, 
uh, there was a summer conference where we would meet with other Taiwanese associations from other cities, Columbus, Chicago, Indianapolis. It was called the Midwest Taiwanese Summer Conference, and it still happens today. My dad told me. There would be tournaments, softball, tennis, volleyball. It was like a mini Olympics of Taiwanese associations. You know, I, I look back, and I'm like, I, I really didn't know what was going on at the time. I, I thought it was just fun and games. And the Midwest is very white, and so I got to hang out with people who looked like me and ate the same foods as me, talked like my parents. I didn't really speak it very well. I thought it was just fun and games. But in reality, it was a group of people trying to maintain their cultural identity. And I had a, I had a really fun talk with my dad a couple weeks ago. So in choosing Daniel 1, I got to bond with my dad or, or all, the, all the stuff they made us do. <laughs> and they were trying to keep a connection to their home country. In the context of today's passage, does that sound familiar? So I was this American, but I was also Taiwanese. And that intersection of identities is how I grew up. And I gave you a glimpse of, of, of a young me <laughs> dancing on stage. It was the compromises and the clashes, and I do mean clashes, of cultures. And that's what I had to navigate growing up. Maybe some of you, some of you can identify with that. Maybe you, you grew up or are currently growing up in a dual culture household. Two worlds. Physically in America, but culturally, ideologically, socially, Taiwanese or Asian in general. All of our parents really tried to hold on to that identity and pass it on to all of us kids, trying to avoid that complete assimilation into the melting pot that is America, the United States of America. Why am I telling you how you grew up? Christians are called to be citizens of two worlds. The secular world that we physically live in and the kingdom that we are a part of. The secular world that we physically live in and the kingdom we are a part of. And we can't surrender our kingdom citizenship by completely assimilating into the culture. But we also can't forget our citizenship to this world by trying to isolate ourselves and, trying, and only living and talking with other Christians like, like pastors often do. And since I became a pastor, my friend group has shrunk into m mostly just Christians and friends of Christians. This is what it means to be in this world but not of this world. And it's the balance of being a citizen of two worlds. And I think that's a challenge for many of us, myself included. And Jane and I are working on, 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 on meeting people outside of our comfort zone, outside of Christians. Daniel had to walk that line in today's passage, slowly being assimilated into Babylon culture while trying to maintain his identity. And my father's family had to walk that same line, slowly being assimilated into Japanese society. I think we are all challenged in how willing we are to be in the world and, and recognizing that we have to draw the line somewhere. And, 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 and that's, a th that's a question, isn't it? You, you, want me, you probably want me to tell you, here's the line to draw. It's difficult to determine, even among Christians. There are those who are more liberal, progressive Christians, and then there are those who have more conservative views. Some entire de denominations of Christians support different lifestyle choices that we, this specific church, don't agree with. I said before, I said this before, the world is not our home. We are on vacation and we will go home to be with Jesus. But that doesn't mean that we should just, that, do, that doesn't mean that we should isolate, isolate ourselves. That doesn't mean that we should despise the world shun the world. We can still enjoy things in the world, like ice cream, <laughs> like the beautiful creation that God has given us, but there are things that we should avoid. The world's values are not Jesus' values. I'll say that again. The world's values are not Jesus' values. We are foreign nationals in this world. 
we are foreign nationals in this world. And as believers, we should be set apart from this world. This is the meaning of being holy, living, uh, of being holy and living a holy, righteous life, to be set apart. That's what that term means. We're not supposed to engage in sin. We're supposed to be sanctified. That process of becoming more and more like Jesus. We are supposed to conform ourselves, conform our minds to that of Christ Jesus. We're not to conform ourselves, conform our minds to the secular world. We're not to conform our minds to the loudest social media group. In Romans 12, I urge you brothers, I, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And that's, that's what it's really about, right? With Daniel, with, with Japan and Taiwan, with, with my parents making their kids do things and dance. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which will affect your words and your actions. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We are simply in this world, physically present, but we're not part of its values. Now, one thing that is very different from Daniel today is that we are not in the middle of a training period like Daniel's three years where we have to be presented to God at the very end to earn our way into heaven, to see if we are good enough. We don't need to do this. It's not like at the end of our lives we have to, like, make the cut, all right? There isn't a tick mark. Every time you do something bad, it goes in your bad column, and every time you do something good, it goes in your good column, and if your good column is, is, is bigger than your, your bad column, then you get into heaven. That, that's not how that works. We are all sinners, every one of us. This, this, this bad column is just, you know, infinite, right? And that levels the playing field for all of us, even if some of us do, might do good things, which is good to do, even if some of us do, do, more, do more, more often do good things. But because we are all sinners, which levels the playing field, we deserve eternal separation from God. God is that holy that he can't be in the presence of bad. He can't be in the presence of sin. And the punishment, that, punishment for that is that eternal separation. But God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us on that cross to take that punishment so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It is only, only, only through God's grace that we, we, we even have this through our faith. It's a tough world out there right now, I know. And when we feel pressure to compromise, we can pray with the others and to courage, uh, to give us, you know, to give each other courage, to give each other wisdom on how to respond, how to honor God in our responses. I, <laughs> I looked at forums. There's a lot of angry people, especially after Roe versus Wade. There's a way to honor God, to wait, to obey God, to respectfully stand up for God. In the meantime, we carry on, as Daniel did, making the best of his circumstances. We carry on in this foreign land until we go home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we ask you to be with us. It is difficult down here. And this is a nation, a world divided. Many different viewpoints. Help us, Father, send the Spirit to us, and as your servant Paul, your apostle Paul wrote in Romans, help us conform to your values, not to the patterns of this world. Help us keep our identity as believers, as Christians, front, first, foremost, above all others. In your son's most holy and precious name, amen. Can we please rise? In this world that we're in, we need a lot of wisdom. And I'm grateful for this song. It just reminds us of the, the core things that are important to us for us to understand as we
go through each day in this life. Thank you. Have a wonderful week.